Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your speaker, Chris McCann. If you'd like more information or to hear more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now, with your evening Bible study, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Genesis. Tonight is study number 13 of Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to be reading verses 9 and 10. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I'll stop reading there. Now we looked at this uh, a little bit in our last study. Some of the statements here where God says Noah was a just man, and we looked at the word just. Well, tonight we're going to take a closer look at the Hebrew word translated as perfect, which is 8549 in Strong's Hebrew Concordance. And this word is found uh, a little further on in Genesis in chapter 17 in verse 1. And it says in Genesis 17, 1, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, Jehovah appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So there, uh, God is commanding Abram to be perfect. And we're not surprised at that because God himself is perfect. And remember what we read in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 5 during the Sermon on the Mount. It says in verse 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. God commands perfection for mankind. It, it, he created man perfect. He created man good and right and just and, and upright. And when God originally created man, man was perfect perfect, without sin, without iniquity of any kind, and he was able to do the will of God perfectly in both body and soul. That is God's standard. God does not have a standard of uh, 90% obedience or faithfulness or 99.9% no, God's standard, his absolute standard that he will not lower, he will not lower the bar for anyone in any way, is perfect obedience, complete, total faithfulness to everything that he says. There must be um, a 100% keeping of the law of God. That's what God does. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And this verse here in Matthew 5.48 really uh, comes from Deuteronomy 18 and verse 13. It says, Thou shalt be perfect with Jehovah thy God. And that's the same word we're looking at in Genesis with Noah. And the same word God uh, commanded to Abram, Be thou perfect. Walk before me perfect. And that does not allow for even one sin. And of course, we wonder and shake our heads, Well, who can among us be perfect? And the answer is, none of us, of our own accord, of our 
own doing, our own will. None of us can obtain perfect righteousness, and that's why it's such a hopeless cause to try and get right with God through the keeping of the law. Because anyone who starts down that road, and and normally people who go down that road, they, they just have a couple of laws or a few laws they think that you have to keep in order to be right with God. Just uh, the Jews thought keep some of the sacrifices and the Sabbath day and, and a few ceremonial laws and And that'll make them right with God. But no, it is a complete, perfect standard. And and if you begin by keeping the law, then you must keep the whole law, the entirety of the law of God, which is laid out in the Bible. And obviously, that's impossible for man to do. And that's why the Bible says that all fall short of the glory of God. There, There's not one righteous. No, not one. There, there are no people anywhere that are able to be perfect before God. Well, then someone may say, if, if that's true, then God would not command us to be perfect. Because there are, there are some, and that they're found in today's um, Christian church, that, that say that God would never command a man to do something he cannot do. And they like to say that uh, in reference to the command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Because they like the idea of uh, simply exercising belief and being saved, it it places salvation in in man's hands where they want it to be, and so they they say when the elect point out, well, the Bible tells us we're dead in sins and and we cannot believe um, sufficiently and and so forth that we're not saved by our own faith but by the faith of Christ when. The child of God correctly points out that the Bible teaches that salvation is of the Lord and not of man, that salvation is impossible with man, but possible with God, that we're not born by the will of man, or as it says in in John 1, uh, verses 12 and 13, by the will of the flesh, but of God, they they come back to this. Well, then you're saying God is commanding us to do something that we cannot do, and that's not right. That's not just. God wouldn't make or issue forth that type of commandment. Well, the Lord Jesus just commanded in Matthew 5, 48, Be ye therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. A command. And God constantly does command things that man is unable to perform in his fallen state or condition because he is a sinner now, desperately wicked in heart, and unable to perform the doing of it. Yet God commands it because in his original creation, man was created perfect. Just imagine if if Jesus said to Adam and Eve before the fall, Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, okay. Is there a difficulty? Is there a problem with Adam and Eve giving perfect obedience to everything God has said? Well, no, they had an ability to do it. And God looks at mankind. He views mankind as responsible agents. That's how he created them, with the ability to obey him and an obligation to obey him. Be ye therefore perfect. Keep my commandments. 
Man could initially, originally do that, and now cannot, but his sinful condition is no excuse. It, it does not justify his sin or excuse it in any way. He is guilty before God for failing to be perfect. And, and, and so if anyone ever says, well, God would never give a command we cannot obey. You, you can point him to Matthew 5.48, where Christ commands, be perfect. Or, in the book of Deuteronomy, where God commands, circumcise the foreskin of your hearts. Now, who can obey that kind of a command? It, it, it's impossible with man to obey God's command to circumcise the foreskin of their heart. It's a spiritual command. It means receive a new heart, be born again, have your sins cut off, have that heart of stone removed, and a new heart inserted. And all of those actions can only be performed by God. And and that's why God gave that command. Of course, the whole Bible is truth, but every now and then God will present a scripture that will give insight into a great many other scriptures. Man can fool himself in, in looking at other commands in the Bible that seem doable and think, well, God expects me to do it and thinks I can do it and, and I'm going to do it. And, and so man deceives himself into thinking he can uh, be obedient to the point of obtaining salvation, such as the command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ total um, self-deception on man's part as he grabs a hold of that commandment and deceives himself into thinking, I'll keep this law and become justified. And yet he willfully ignores because uh, people who hold onto the free will doctrine have been confronted with scripture after scripture after scripture, they willfully ignore. He just willfully ignores that the Bible says that man is not justified by the works of the law. The command to believe on the Lord Jesus is a command, and therefore part of the law of God, and you cannot be justified in God's sight through the keeping of the law of God, whether whether that law is physical circumcision of the foreskin, or whether that law is a command to believe on the Lord Jesus. Neither attempted act of obedience can justify the sinner. No, no, you, you have to believe from the heart. And in order to believe from the heart, you need a new heart to begin with. And only God can do that. Okay, let's go back here to Genesis 6, verse 9. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And again, the, the Hebrew word perfect, 8549, is also translated as without blemish, and a couple of times without spot. It's the same word that's found in Exodus 12, beginning in verse 5. It says, Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, he shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. He shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it, in the evening. And that's speaking of the Passover lamb. And the Passover lamb is a, a historical parable. It's a type and a figure of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And the lamb must be without blemish. And we know exactly what God means. It cannot have a spot or wrinkle because that would be as though there was sin in the perfect sacrifice. And, and there could not be sin in the Lord Jesus. 
And so God makes a point of emphasizing that through the sacrificial system by indicating that the lamb would be without blemish. That is, the Lord Jesus was perfect, just as he said concerning God. Be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, and Christ is one with the Father. And and he, he is eternal God himself. The, the child that would be born, according to Isaiah 9, his name shall be called Everlasting Father. Christ is perfect, and when he offered up himself at the point of the world's foundation, before this world or this creation uh, was spoken into being, before God created anything uh, related to this earth or this universe, Christ died spotlessly. He, he had no sin. He had never transgressed a word of the law of God. The law of God was magnified above all his name. He was in perfect and total submission to all the commandments of God from all eternity past. You know, God's uh, perfectness is not something new. He has always been perfect. He is the perfect being from all past eternity and will remain perfect into all future eternity. And, And so the Lord Jesus, being that perfect God, offered up himself. And, and of course, there was not a blot, not a spot of any kind on a lamb. Uh, he was without sin, and it was necessary he be without sin so that he could bear the sins of others, the sins of his people. And then he became laden with iniquity. He, he became filthy with the sins of all of those that he would save. And and then he paid the price for all of those dirty, rotten, filthy sins. He became sin for us and died in our place. And, and then through death, he purged the sin. He paid the penalty in full and was raised from the dead once again without spot. There there was no more iniquity. All of our mountain, and it would have been uh, an incredible size mountain, certainly dwarfing the tallest mountains that are in the world today. It, it would have been just an enormous mass of ugly deeds and thoughts and actions, and and all of them paid for, all of them removed, washed from him. That's the language of the Bible. That's what baptism means. He was baptized through the fires of hell, hell meaning the grave or death, as he died to make payment for our sin God's wrath, the the fire and brimstone of his word, washed away all the sin from Christ, and he emerged after the baptism of being under the wrath of God. He emerged cleansed, and, and, and we were baptized with the baptism that he was baptized with because it was our sins and and so we are cleansed we are clean and and as it says concerning noah who found grace in the eyes of the lord we become just or righteous in the sight of god and we become perfect in god's sight we no longer have any blemish we we are without blemish. There's no other better way, I think, to say it. There is not 
one spot. You know, with our physical bodies, uh, because of sin, because of the corruption, the curse that God has placed upon man, upon the creation, uh, from the time we're born, we're, we're born imperfectly. Some uh, have marks or imperfections in their body. Uh, well, all do, but some are more visible or evident. But as we age, what is seen? Well, wrinkles come and skin marks or moles and 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 all kinds of things start appearing and and the body shows the corruption it it shows the spots it it shows the effects of sin whereas of course if man had never fallen into sin his body was perfect and there would have been no imperfections of any kind in the physical body and and when God um, resurrects his people and grants them spiritual resurrected bodies to match their souls, they will all be perfect in body once again. No blemish of any kind in the physical body. Well, that's how God views all of his elect right now. He sees no marks. He doesn't see and any any blemishes of any kind. Uh, this is why the Bible speaks of all the elect is, as uh, being in white, wearing white fine linen, which is the righteousness of the saints. It's why God speaks of his elect as a holy nation or a holy priesthood. And, and he looks at his people as being pure. Pure. Do we still sin after salvation while we're in our physical body? Yes. Does God see it on one level? Of course, he sees that we we sinned, that we said something, thought something, did something that, that is against his law. And he may chastise or correct us for it, but for each one that's truly born again and, and truly a child of God, on another level, he does not see it, because that sin was paid for also. Therefore, as with David who sinned with Bathsheba, God says, you will not die. But David was chastised. He did not die because he was a child of God. And if God saw our sin, we would die. And and yet he doesn't, because he himself has washed us. And and again, we have been baptized with the baptism that Christ was baptized with. Remember what it says in Ephesians chapter 5, and, and this is good instruction for husbands concerning how we're to view our wives and, and to treat them and consider them. In Ephesians chapter 5, It says, beginning in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, and that would be the eternal church, not the corporate church, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You see how God has taken care of the sin problem completely when it comes to his elect people. He has washed them. It's past tense. The, all of the elect have been washed. And, and um, the, the application of that atoning work, the saving work, the baptizing work of the Lord Jesus Christ was made through the word of God, through the hearing of the Bible 
as the gospel went forth into the world, and the word reached the hearts of God's elect, and God created new hearts within them, washing away all sin, and they were baptized at that point with the Holy Spirit, and and made anew, clean and pure in the sight of God. And we may at times be disgusted with ourselves and and at times probably uh, rightly so because of the wrongs that we've done. Maybe we've continued to sin in the face of God's grace and, and so forth and we were disgusted with our failure to have more proper control and dominion over our own bodies whatever it may be. But the truth is, and the fact remains, concerning one of God's elect, that the things that we might see in our daily life, the sins that that may still afflict us from time to time, are not spots or wrinkles or, or a blemish upon us in any way, because they've all been washed away. And so really the thing for us to do when when we have fallen into a sin is not to mope, not to feel sorry for ourselves, not to condemn ourselves. No, there's there's no more condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, but it is to say, "Oh my, God paid for this sin too, and and it just, look at all the many sins I've done that the Lord Jesus Christ has paid for and died for, and, and, and he commands me to be ye therefore perfect. It, it is to approach it as the Lord Jesus spoke to the woman caught in adultery. He said after her accusers went away, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Is there no man to condemn thee? She said, No man, Lord. And then Christ said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And and you see, that's the perspective of the child of God. Forget those things which are behind. We can't change them. Press toward the things that are before us. And what's before us today is to take up our cross and to obey the word of God, to be perfect as much as lieth in us by God's Spirit, to desire to do and to keep his commandments, to show forth love for Christ in that way, and at the end of the day, when there's any imperfections or any failures to be perfect, we turn to the Lord and say, Oh Lord, I'm sorry, I I failed on this point. I sinned in this manner. Strengthen me not to do it again. And again, as he said to the woman caught in adultery, God says this each time to one of his elect, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. It's a renewal of our daily commandment, really, to obey the will of God. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies. You can hear these studies Monday through Friday over Pal Talk, Skype, eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over your phone. For more information or to hear other studies, visit www.ebiblefellowship.com. Until our next study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.